Welcome to this short video on the history of biotechnology. So in essence, when we speak about biotechnology, we use biology or biological systems, think of for instance microorganisms, to produce valuable substances or to do specific tasks. And I'll give you a couple of examples of how biotechnology has really evolved from air brewing, which is probably the first application of biotechnology, to how it's now an invaluable tool both in environmental engineering but also in the pharmaceutical industry. So the root of biotechnology comes from zymology or zymotechnology, which is essentially the technology related to fermentation. So this comes from a Greek word which essentially means to leaven. So for instance, think of you making your cake or baking bread, for instance. It means to leaven means you make the dough actually lighter by adding gas. And that obviously that adding of gas is because of the fermentation and because of the yeast producing carbon dioxide. So actually, so the father of like what we call zymology or zymotechnology was Louis Pasteur, who discovered in 1872 that this fermentation was due to microbes. Obviously, this process was around for a very long time and the beer brewing industry was really, really booming. Uh, but it just people weren't aware of how this actually worked. Um, so later on, they uncovered the role of wild yeasts in beer. Uh, and basically, if it was the system was uncontrolled, it means that the, uh, the beer would go off. So actually, this is when they started to implement strategies in order to, for instance, control the flavor and to control the quality of the beer. So for a long time, this really fermentation uh, was limited to beer brewing, which was one of the biggest industries that countries would have. However, in 1884, this is when we started to extend this to food as well, not just to beer. Uh, and then finally in 1919, so after the First World War, where fermentation really played an important role because of the need for like food and drink, etc. This is when Karl Araki coined the term biotechnology. So actually biotechnology has been around for more than a century. So after the First World War, slowly there started to be applications for biotechnology in healthcare. And one of the really important uh, discoveries there was Fleming's discovery of penicillin, uh, because it kind of, in a way, made healthcare reliant on chemical engineering. So, and this all went very rapidly because by 1957, there were more than 350 antibiotics in the market. So you can imagine antibiotics are, have been very important role in, for instance, when people have to have major surgery or for controlling infection. So it's really massively contributed towards our quality of life. However, we also know now that antibiotic resistance is a global health threat. And actually, this is getting worse uh, since COVID uh, because we started using more and more antibiotics. And also because of that, there's more antibiotics that goes like in water. But even in food, you can find traces of antibiotics. Um, so that's something that we need to be mindful of and something that we really need to control. In the 1960s, a lot of other drugs started coming to the market. And a very important one was the rise of cortisone, which is normally used to treat inflammation. In the late 1950s, there was also a, a revolution in healthcare when the vaccine for polio was introduced. In 1954, the Nobel Prize was awarded for the successful cultivation of polio virus. And then Salk developed a vaccination, which he first tested on himself and his family, and which was pretty soon licensed after that. And it's, this really meant that there was a rapid drop in cases. What was very unique about this case, because nowadays you hear a lot about patents, but actually Salk was very committed to equitable access. So when people asked him about it, he said that there was no patent in place, so he actually never made a profit from this. So what has also rapidly taken off in the last couple of years is the use of antibodies, and particularly monoclonal antibodies in, for instance, cancer treatment, uh, but also in other autoimmune diseases. So you would recognize that if the, the name of, of the medication ends in MAP, then it relates to a monoclonal antibody. So until all the COVID vaccinations came onto the market, the most sold drug uh, was Umira, on which I have a separate video, which is used to treat, for instance, rheumatoid arthritis. So all of these are like very important applications in healthcare, but let's have a look at some of like the downsides and some of the resistance that was initially towards these applications for biotechnology. So the helical structure of DNA was discovered in the 1950s. And so this really opened up new applications, particularly in the 1970s when we look at recombinant DNA discovery. Uh, and that meant that you could use, for instance, enzymes to copy-paste genes and to insert them into different regions, so you could manipulate the properties. 
However, there was a lot of resistance to this, not just from healthcare applications, but also agricultural applications. Uh, and one main example of this was the 1968 book, The Biological Time Bomb. And actually it had a very depressing cover uh, where it looked at these are all the things that can happen since we have like these techniques in DNA where people met, said you could marry, for instance, artificial, like a robot. Uh, you could live up to 150 years, which we still haven't achieved. Um, and it warned for the signs of genetic engineering. That so for a long time and still even to date, there is some hesitance towards the use of this genetic engineering, mainly because of not fully understanding what would happen and thinking that it might change the structure of your own DNA. And a key turning point perhaps in this process was the production or the using biotechnology to produce insulin. Um, so first this was extracted from animals and I think you can imagine that simply given like the sheer amount of people that have diabetes at the moment, this wouldn't be a sustainable solution. And in 1982 the FDA approved the first recombinant drug of any kind really and this was related to insulin. And nowadays obviously we use bacteria for instance and we use microorganisms to produce a lot of these pharmaceuticals including insulin. So where is biotechnology now? So I've done a lot of videos on bioreactors where I talked about that we're looking more towards bespoke systems, smaller systems using continuous uh, processing. But generally there's a couple of areas that we can focus on uh, where the direction of modern biotechnology is heading. And there's quite a few on here. Some of them are quite general, like in terms of the sector. So for instance, artificial intelligence is playing a bigger role in our lives, similar to big data. Um, so that's also definitely the case in biotechnology. Uh, and what we've seen now, uh, definitely in terms of gene editing, uh, we've seen the Nobel Prize being won for CRISPR uh, a while ago. This will allow us to make novel treatments or novel products uh, that can be very helpful. And the same kind of applies into gene sequencing. Actually, the fifth point relates to precision medicine, and this is what a lot of my research is about as well. Uh, so my job title is actually Professor in Engineering Biology, uh, which is linked to synthetic biology. Um, and particularly we see this in the area of cancer, where we try to tailor the treatment as well as we can towards a particular patient. So they can be based on the, the type of disease they have, because in the case of cancer, it can be very heterogeneous, uh, but it can be also based on your own circumstances. So you could see a lot of drugs work very differently if you have like a very different, for instance, diet uh, for men and women that doesn't work in the same way either. Or it could be related to your lifestyle pattern in general. Other things that are heavily looked into relate to biomanufacturing. So first of all, we look at, for instance, a potential shortage of food supply. We're getting more and more people onto Earth and I have a particular video on artificial meat. Uh, but we also see more of a hype around growing organs uh, in the lab because there's definitely a shorter shortage of donor organs. And then finally, we get things like bioprinting, uh, which can also be used, for instance, to print these organs, uh, but to print other structures that are very important, where we also look at microfluidics, so looking at smaller, smaller, smaller systems. And actually, a key problem with microfluidics, if you would have watched a documentary or if you are familiar with the story of Farinos, which promised that in a single drop of blood, you could diagnose lots and lots of different conditions. So hopefully that is something that will be possible in the future. And I think in the case of Farinos, it was clearly a case of overpromising things. Um, but we are developing better and better technologies to diagnose things from sim simple finger prick tests. So we obviously know this for glucose, uh, but this could also be applied to a wide range of other diseases. So when I talk about genetic engineering, it means that we insert new genetic information in existing cells in order to modify specific organisms for the purpose that we want. And this is actually something that's more commonly employed than you think, uh, particularly in uh, the field of agriculture. So for instance, this can be employed in plants to give them better resistance against viruses or against herbicides, uh, but also to enhance nutrition. And this is something that we often employ in research as well, where we have animal models in order to test, for instance, pharmaceuticals uh, before we go into a human trials. So this is a very important component for bringing drugs to the market. So hopefully you enjoyed this short video uh, and it gave you just a flavor of the history of biotechnology. However, I do have a couple of videos that go more into depth on certain topics that I've discussed. Thanks for watching.